Thank you for coming. Um, I'm, I'm Stephanie Lin. I'm the, the Dean of the School of Architecture, um, as well as a co-faculty member. Um, I'm so excited to introduce Sean Canty. Um, he is an assistant professor of architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, he's also the principal of Studio SC and co-founder of Office 3 um, with Ryan Gollenberg and I. As many of you know, the school um, organized a series of talks around three themes of regional architecture, housing, and expanded discourse. Um, Sean's lecture falls into the second theme of housing, particularly relating to our USONIA 21 program, which I'm sure will resonate with those students who recently completed the summer studio, um, looking at combining collective and residential uses um, into a multi-use building. USONIA 21 seeks to provide more accessible, sustainable, and innovative solutions to underserved communities through real built projects and is led by our Prez, uh, Chris Lash, who's here right now. Um, this is our very first TSOA event in the, um, in the new studio. Actually, that got moved to the Red Room. Um, um, and um, we've been renovating our studios um, with the Kosani Foundation. Um, thanks also to all the Arcanauts who were able to come. Um, as well as everyone who's been involved in that renovation project. And of course, to our students for, for setting up this event. Um, uh, Sean's work deals with defamiliarization, taking familiar elements and configurations and transforming them to reveal their inner workings, cracking open their formal, social, and experiential expectations, as well as their assumed systems of evaluation. He will be showing new work today, which develops his investigations on familiar housing types into something quite other as they confront the pressures of urban form, um, assembly, and representation as a generative tool for imagining new ways of living collectively. Sean, Ryan, and I first met in 2007 while working at a firm called Iwamoto Scott in San Francisco. Um, and as students and recent graduates of the California College of the Arts in San Francisco, and UC Berkeley um, in the East Bay. Um, while we all have our own practices, we're also always in communication through Office 3, um, which is both a collective as well as a platform for discussion. Um, over the many years that we've known each other, it's been such a pleasure to see Sean's work evolve, um, refine, scale up, scale down, and tackle important questions of how we can live together more creatively, more openly, um, and from the domestic to the public realm. Um, after the lecture, I encourage you to ask him questions about his work, um, how he practices, maintains his priorities in a challenging field, and how academics and professional projects align for him. Lastly, um, I also just want to acknowledge Ryan's presence, which is very rare. Um, I haven't seen him in a long time. Neither is Sean. No, yeah, he's, he's right there. He's supposed to be filming. Um, yeah, and it's, it's even rare for us to be physically together. So I'm, I'm just very excited for the students to um, spend more time with both of them in the next couple of days. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Sean Canty. It's so great to be here with really close friends. Uh, Stephanie and Ryan and I have practically grown up together. And I really want to thank you all for inviting me to your community and for the students for um, having me here. I titled this talk, A Typical Houses, um, as a way to articulate and also um, perhaps reflect on the various approaches of the studio in its engagement with domestic typologies and how they serve as spaces to speculate on questions of closeness, nearness, togetherness, and programmatic mixity. We work at a range of different scales, um, from pavilions uh, to single-family dwellings uh, to multi-family dwellings um, and collective housing. Each project interrelates abstractions of form uh, with social content. 
Um, and this duality transforms the familiar into the atypical. And I like to think that this condition, uh, the atypical or an exception or an, or an anomaly within architecture draws attention to the norms that we often take for granted in both practice and everyday experience. We're also able to arrive at these proposals through what I call rehearsals and form, independent of content, or sometimes problematizing form through content, um, which would be program, site, uh, material assembly, um, or a particular building typology. Such rehearsals allow us to practice to explore ways in which form is legible and precise, or how it might operate more ambiguously, putting the typical and atypical into a productive friction to invite closer readings of both. Um, so we also like to seek out and draw inspiration from precedents, deal with exceptional or atypical situations, and how they might figure into the body of work. Um, this is such the case for a favorite precedent of mine since, since my days in school, an 18th century architect and geometer, uh, Philibert Delorme. And he had to uh, add a small study to an existing villa. And the story was so poetically described by Robin Evans in his book, The Projective Cast. My interest here is in the rigorous conception of Delorme's edition. Here, forced to add a study where there was no place within the plan to absorb, the solution was to add a small cylindrical room to an existing corner. Delorme deploys geometry in such a way that the proposal eludes immediate classification, and at first glance is paradoxical in its formal character. It is both additive and coarse in its resolution, the cylindrical tower above, and smooth and negated in its resolution below. And the conjoinment of these two radically different sensibilities is fused with a meandering edge that resembles a loose squiggle. The ability to synthesize these, uh, what I call coexisting clarities, between the lower half of the, of the study and the upper half, um, into a new whole is enabled by a conical arch. These properties as a developable surface allow the architect to move between a space of two-dimensional flatness and into three-dimensional form. And as a result, the architect is able to devise a sketchy scene between arch and cylinder. So as visual research, we explore their own misbehaved corners, which deploy the use of formal tangency in both plan and elevation to conjoin cylindrical volumes with flat surfaces. So here we have two volumes that are kind of kitty corner uh, that die into the, the flat surfaces of the corner. And we use tangency and plan and elevation as a kind of common formal device within the work to choreograph relationships between parts or programs or sites. But we finished this series off with the final drawing, purely in elevation, that was exhibited um, as a part of a group show at the CCA in San Francisco called Drawing Codes. We also do other kinds of rehearsals and form. Most recently, we've been exploring drawing and formal techniques of folding and tucking boxes. Folds and tucks for us have been kind of of interest um, as techniques of displacing a surface to another axis or dimension. And they both have different kinds of perceptual qualities, uh, appearing flat and creased or soft and supple. Uh, this summer, I was also invited to participate in a group show on architectural drawing at a gallery in New York City. Um, and the theme of the show was around, around the drawing representations in architecture that were not meant for construction or any sort of professional communication between an architect and a client. But the drawings had to be motivated by some other conceit, either formal, meditative, or purely experimental. And my submission explored what I, what I like to say formal and typological ent entanglements. And this was through three silkscreen prints. Each drawing in this series depicts a simple gable that has been distorted and deformed through the introduction of curvature. And the process of drawing is used to describe how these similar shapes are combined. So each of the prints combines two axonometric views, one that's a worm's eye and one that's a bird's eye, and provides just enough information to understand the entirety of each object while also confusing its legibility as a whole. At each hinge between the two views, the graphic language of the drawing inverts the relationship between fill, line, and color. Taken together, the series of prints explore the ways that the formal slip might be reflected in a representational slip, 
which is then translated into a material slip within the screen printing process. So those are kind of tangents or, or formal research or representational research that operates alongside of the body of projects. And so the first house um, or first project I'll show today is the Janus house. And this was a proposal of, of trying to conjoin two residences on a single exurban lot. So the plan of the Janus house arrives at its composition by merging key traits of two recognizable housing types into a single volume. The axiality of a dog trot house on the left and the centrality of a courtyard typology. Um, and you can see in this diagram the way in which each typology kind of sets up the organization of rooms and also the organization of views within the house. One that has a kind of two volumes that are self-similar with an axial spine with views perpendicular to that spine. And then a courtyard where views are concentrated towards the center. The house's twin logic is established through this transformation of the dog trot. The dog trot is characterized by a covered open space and two gabled wings. While the dog trot is inherently symmetrical in plan, the Janus house signals this organization, but it's immediately altered. Public spaces are concentrated towards the front of the house, and private spaces are towards the rear. The organization of the house takes inspiration from other twin organizations or other twin pieces of architecture, like the churches at the Piazza del Popolo. These are perhaps the most famous exploration of twinning, commissioned by Pope Alexander. The churches were designed and developed by a series of architects from Carlo Rinaldi to Carlo Fontana and finally Bernini. That's what's interesting about these two churches is they look identical in the, in the piazza, but their plans are slightly different. So one church has a circular plan and the other church has an elliptical plan. And this is due to certain conditions of site. The sites aren't quite the same. One could say that the elliptical plan, given that it has an axis, is kind of more participating spatially to the piazza, while the centralized plan of the, of the church on the left is more inward looking. So within the Janus house, the two residences occupy a left and right wing whose boundary line is blurred by the relationship of the public spaces and the connection to the courtyard. The insertion of the circular courtyard complicates the initial reading of the dog trot plan and introduces an ambiguity between the house's center and perimeter. And this sets up a diversity of spatial experiences within the interior. Sublimating certain typological features in favor of geometric plasticity is the first in a set of atypical techniques applied to American house forms. Exaggerating and contorting primitive forms, which emphasizes the parts within the whole, and restrained introversion, which conceals the relationship of interior spaces. And so I'll just click through a few visuals. This is looking at the house from the front, at the rear, and the shared courtyard between the two sides. The next project is actually a fairly recent piece. It was a body of research that we did over the summer. We were asked to participate in the Royal Academy's annual summer exhibition, which just which opened a few weeks ago in September. The show was curated by Yinka Schonebeer and under the theme of Reclaiming Magic, and the architecture room was curated by Sir David Adjay with the theme of climate and geography, or vice versa. And the architecture room focused on context, site, geography, climate, political climate, people and community and culture. And so we submitted a proposal in a large scale print of a speculative regenerative urban proposal for a scarred and neglected block within Philadelphia in the Coppice Creek neighborhood. And actually this is our model here in the foreground. The site was once a vibrant black middle class neighborhood and the former home to the controversial Black Liberation Group move. At the time, the group and its ideologies and lifestyle were kind of incommensurate with their neighbors and the local authorities, yet they valued collectivity, education, alternative ways of relating to the city and landscape, and were very much anti-establishment. The city block that housed move was brutally bombed by the city of Philadelphia in 1985. The shocking act was the culmination of years of tensions between the group, the city, and their nearby middle-class neighbors. Three rows of housing were raised to the ground, displacing many long-term residences. And recalling this extreme instance of racial and spatial injustice as a type of forced removal, it is a stark reminder at a moment where climate inequality is creating conditions for further displacement. While the conditions surrounding this bombing were not directly derived from climate emergency, the spatial injustice engages questions of how we live alongside loss 
and each other in response to these injustices. And as a result, our speculative proposal engages the site as a way to think about the changing social and cultural forces implicated by our changing climate. While the row houses were eventually rebuilt by the city, they were rebuilt with little care, echoing the trauma at the center of the bombing. At the start of this research, we began to closely collaborate with our friends and engineers at AKT2 based in London. Um, to build a body of knowledge around the bioclimatic knowledge of Philadelphia. And one thing that we discovered was there was a close correlation between poverty levels within a city and heat exposure. You can see Cobb's Creek neighborhood indicated here in, in orange. Red is the worst, orange is bad, and dark green is very good. With this knowledge, we began to explore a series of studies at the scale of the block that interrelated new housing with a series of green and open spaces and green and open spaces. This was the site before the bombing, this was the site after the bombing, and then this was the kind of subpar reconstruction of the homes that were lost. So we did a series of kind of new block compositions in which we assumed the same amount of housing units within the block, um, but tried to integrate open space to address and mitigate questions of climate. In each, the goal was to improve the well-being of the residences through the manipulation of urban form, new housing, and insertion of the commons. In the end, we decided to open up the inner block by not rebuilding the homes that were destroyed and to introduce a collective commons while still maintaining the same density of housing. This strategy ended up having a tremendous effects on both the social life of the block and the climatic comfort. In some of the bioclimatic studies of the proposal, we discovered that the voided interior of the block in addition to green space, it significantly cooled the block and the surrounding area. So here, this is just a, a rendering showing air temperature with the block voided, mostly hard surfaces. And here, with the introduction of green space, um, how it significantly cools and mitigates the, the air flow and climate within the block, but also within some of the surrounding blocks as well. In the site plan, you can see the final composition of the block, the location of our proposed housing, which are at a slight tilt to maximize passive cooling and solar exposure. Some residences are single family homes and some duplex residences. The interior commons has different fields for activities and mid block passages from adjacent streets that allow access from the surrounding area to the inner block. And then this was the drawing that we submitted for the RA show. This was a diptych, which we used to kind of articulate the social life of the front and back of the block, and also the material and tectonic character of the new housing stock, in which we were exploring and speculating on the use of CLT and mass timber, both to reduce embodied carbon. And we explored a, a series of strategies and studies in terms of the fenestration openings to kind of tackle fuel poverty. This drawing also articulates the way in which we abstracted and played up certain typological features of the row home to address climate and foster a sense of collectivity. So we maintained the stoop, but we kind of raised it higher as a kind of elevated print to kind of protect homes from um, inclement storm surges, but also to maintain a, a social connection to the street. There's two types of porches. There's an open porch and an enclosed porch. And then there's a series of terraces that occupy the front and back of the row home. So in the plan, the, it shows how the pair of row homes share light core. And this allows for diffuse daylighting, but also airflow into the interior of the plan. So the vertical circulation hinges around this core and allows for neighbors to have chance encounters with each other, but also that space is a kind of indoor, outdoor, occupiable room. These are just some kind of typical plans of each of the residences. On the, the top plan is one that's a single family residence with a two-story duplex. The lower plan is a single family home. We developed a series of kind of wall sections exploring the CLT buildup as well as other materials. And then we did a series of renderings kind of internally just to kind of begin to kind of test the, the urban scenario and to kind of use rendering as a tool to kind of both think about atmosphere and to also make the sun present and absent at the same time. So here we're looking at it at a, on a very summer day at noon. This is a, the street wall of the urban block. You notice that the facade has a kind of fluting which we use to kind of produce shading and we have um, very minimal openings. And then this is the backside of the block or the inner block where we introduce the commons in the courtyard. It's both a space of recreation, but also a space of respite.
The next house I like to show is called the Roundhouse. This is a kind of, of looking at curvature, CLT, and stress skins. And we start the research by this process of folding a cone. We did this both in terms of my own kind of fascination with singly curved geometries and the kinds of complexities that they could produce. And in this case, we were looking to see how they could produce a kind of implied subdivision in the plan through this formal operation of folding. So the cone is folded successively three times, and then the, that geometry is intersected with a series of planar folds. This was done a number of times to kind of get different kinds of intensities, but as you can see, the effects between the planar and curved fold, folds are um, is a kind of patterning on the surface of the geometry. From these tests, we developed a final version that kind of concentrates the formal complexity in two moments. Here, simply graphically reading this as like, this might be the concentration of more cellular spaces and where the curve and, and planar folds don't intersect is where kind of more open and public spaces might occupy within the house. So this is that process rendered in 3D that sets up a kind of parity between private and public spaces. This is a schematic plan, two residences that share a courtyard and a large singular porch. Conceptually, the house is defined by two horizontal planes, the roof and the ground plane. This also acts as a metaphor for the logic of assembly, where the house's walls are sandwiched between the ground plane and the strut skin roof. The figure of fidelity is concentrated towards the roof as a defining element, with the rest of the spatial subdivision kept relatively simple. And then as with a lot of the previous work in trying to think about building curved surfaces, we're kind of revisiting a kind of old, not so new technology of stress skins as a way of enabling curvature, but kind of prefabricating before it comes to a site in addition to CLT. The roof remains slightly oversized to provide a generous porch around the exterior of the building. And the wraparound porch also provides a level of privacy that is distinct from the shared central courtyard, meaning that because of the curvature, the relationship of a room to its immediate porch is actually quite private, even though the porch is continuous you know, as it moves around the house versus the courtyard is exposed to both residences at the same time. And then these are just some images that are in progress, placing it in, in a setting. The next project was also a kind of research project that we did this, this summer. We were invited by a group of young GST graduates who just started a collective called Rift Studio. They were part of the Chicago Biennial, the available city, and they were curating a, a space, a part of the, of the Biennial, that was focused on what it might mean to consider an architecture of reparations. They actually put out an RFP and they invited a series of young architects and designers to respond to this RFP of, of thinking about a kind of more nimble and inclusive way of development. The many forms at HR 40, which is the commission that's studying preparations and proposals for that, what might be the many ways that that could take place. In this case, the site was in Bronzeville, Chicago, which displaced many African-American residents due to the expansion of IIT's campus. And so the RFP really called to kind of provide as much housing as possible for descendants of those displaced residents that's comfortable and safe housing, and that might also be a model for institutions and public agencies to kind of build upon. They offered a series of sites in Bronzeville, therefore we were kind of drawn to this site is very small and, and narrow and very linear. And one big part of the proposal was to not kind of enforce or kind of lay down a kind of mega project, but to try to be very nimble, agile, and strategic about these interventions and insertions within the city. So this site was very long and linear, but it had a kind of like double face or it kind of bridged two streets, which we found kind of interesting. And then it was also a lot of greenscape. This was our kind of general massing strategy, which was trying to kind of insert retail at the ground level and to residential units above. These are a set of images that were part of the RFP proposal, which really had a reverence for the kind of architectural character of, of Bronzeville. And we drew a lot of inspiration from these context images. We explored a series of massing studies in which we were really trying to articulate the, the retail level kind of separate from the residential level. 
in each study, we're kind of looking at different kinds of formal characters and the kind of figural potential of the roof to kind of inform the plan, um, as in some of the other work that I've done. And then we've landed on this scheme, which is motivated by a kind of circulation core that splits the center of the facade, but also produces a kind of staggering, a series of staggered openings on either side of it. On the back side, because of the lush green landscape, we kind of want the, the back to kind of be open and accessible. And so we decided to kind of introduce a terrace like or a cascade on the back side. So this is a rendering of the final proposal. Uh, that's that central circulation core at the front of the property. Unit one is above that, unit two is above that. And we decided to kind of introduce a kind of communal gathering space that can be used by the community, but also a cafe and shop towards the rear. And we proposed that this would be a kind of infill insertion that could serve as an annex for a local nonprofit called Bright Star, which sought to kind of train community members, teenagers to kind of enter back into the workforce. And we thought that this might be serve as both a kind of annex space for them, but also could house those employees above. Um, so this is the plan of the ground level. We were kind of imagining through these reduced diagrams a series of ways that it might be activated during different times or different kinds of events. These are plans of the upper flats, both with two bedrooms, a pretty generous living room, a kitchen, and um, a shared bathroom. And these were some images uh, in which we were um, kind of trying to represent the culture in and around the project. This is of the, of the back where the cat, cafe kind of spills out into the a patio, and then the terraces for the residential units above. The last project that I'll show tonight is a pavilion proposal called Eggers Shed. Um, this was planned for the Boston Seaport area in a park called Sea Green. And this proposal was inspired by actually two structures that my great-grandfather Edgar built and designed. On the left is a juke joint in a bar. On the right was a home that he built for his family. These two structures are in Bishopville, South Carolina. And I was drawn to a certain different elements, particularly the asymmetrical gable and openings, but as well as the kind of social life within the juke joint and the social life of the porch. And so our proposal was to kind of have an asymmetrical gable that opened up on one side that could allow for a space of occupation, but dropped on the other side that could form as a kind of facade or backdrop. And that the oversized gable would also cantilever from two walls to allow for three distinct porches. We imagined different kinds of scenarios of how it might be activated through the event. So uh, this was during the pandemic, so a kind of socially distant gathering here. This is post-pandemic, I suppose. People are more close together and vaccinated. And in here, we're acting as a space of respite and pause. This was just a kind of a kind of framing model, quite some robust structure in here to make the gable um, actually cantilever that we were able to kind of work out with our structural engineers. Because it was in the park and in the public realm, we really wanted to be kind of playful and engaging. And so we explored a series of kind of color studies. This looking at a series of monotone color studies, a kind of series of multi-tone color studies where the sheathing is kind of is painted and is kind of leaking through the, the overscaled shingles. And then these were some final renderings of the proposal. I mean, actually, these are these are all um, proposals that have not yet been built. Um, uh, but that would be something I would certainly be interested in, in doing. I don't know if I would ever document it, but I probably would just be, a, you know, a bit of a you know, a lurker, just, <laughs> just kind of, you know, just checking things out and seeing um, how people are enjoying.
the dining space. So yeah, we were, we were, uh, we were looking at kind of marine, marine grade plywood. <laughs> we're trying to use just kind of simple everyday materials, um, but playing with scale and color um, and composition and trying to you know, represent them in a kind of new way. Um, and also um, a way that also kind of exposed maybe their, its logic of assembly to a kind of a larger audience, maybe those that don't know much about architecture can kind of just see the end of this wall here and, and maybe understand what's what's going on. Were, were these meant to be kind of more temporary then? Like, were, you know, not exposed at all? Yes, this was supposed to be for up for three months. Yeah, yeah. How does the pandemic have to, or has it been kind of process of vision, like interior visioning and residential spaces in terms of how you've interacted with your, your home or your spaces here? Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, certainly I, as you know, certainly I was quite blessed early in the pandemic to live very adjacent to green space. And so I think in most of the projects, there's some kind of void or some kind of like inside outside condition that kind of um, claims a piece of the outside world for your for your own. And I think that's something that I think a lot of people kind of value to have, um, even if it's a porch or a terrace, because some people didn't have that. And so, um, yeah, so I'm just like super conscious of that now. Yeah. Do you envision it as a built in place or modular and shipping? Let's take this one for example. How do you envision it would be put together from the material? Yeah, so this one I I wanted to kind of just be like made and shipped that every contractor that I spoke with wanted to build it on site. Like in 20 pieces. <laughs> they wanted to build it on site. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then there are some other projects. I mean, what kind of led to the roundhouse research was actually a project that Ryan and I collaborated on, and we had a kind of difficult site and constrained budget and, and client. Um, and uh, I began exploring um, structural cassettes, which you can prefab components of a curved surface beforehand and can kind of bring it bring it to the site and uh, and assemble it quite quickly. Um, so I'm thinking, I think I'm trying to think about it at both ends, you know, but you'd be surprised, you know, I think it's one way and then I can't in fact, okay, this should, this Do you work. spend much time with builders when you're designing? Um, recently, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I've been working closely with two structural engineers um, recently and that's been very, you know, very, very great. <laughs> Um, I'm all for collaboration, and actually, they've they really informed the work in, in in really really good ways. Do you end up visualizing one way to put it together, or multiple ways that could be addressed by the builder? Do you have one optimized way that each house would be built? So, for instance, for this pavilion, we studied like two 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 different ways. Mm -hmm. of doing it. One was that we would build everything else but the curved wall and we would prefab the curved wall and bring it to the site but everything else would be built on site. Yes. But the idea with the and it's actually kind of a similar idea with some of the houses like the the thinking is, is to kind of concentrate the, the formal complexity to one area so like the drum of each of the houses but everything else around that is fairly standard balloon framing construction and it's just kind of coordinating how those things interface with each other. So who do you, one final question. Who do you envision would live in any of your houses? Let's say the, the demographic of the of the person, are they millennial or are they retired? Are they working in town or I think millennials, or I think a younger generation that's that desires a sense of home home ownership, and also yes. also 
maybe doesn't need an ex- a whole house to themselves, but desire to, the desire to be in conversation or near someone else, a close family member, a friend. Um, but it's a kind of a collective. I think you, each of the proposals is kind of a kind of a, a kind of collective mm-hmm. engagement rather than a single person. Yeah, so, many of the projects that you share, they kind of rip on these single family from typologies, but none of them are quite that. Um, so that's what you've shown, where a multi family or else, um, or else uh, a big amount of the pavilion or poly. Um, and um, yeah, it'd be great to hear more about how that type um, gets transformed through a process and through. Um, yeah, I mean, I think part of it's like maybe just kind of accepting the kind of contextual baggage, you know, and, yeah. and trying to do something new with that. Yeah. I think the other part of it is maybe. Mm, a kind of social protocol that I'm kind of trying to put forward and actually, you know, but some municipalities in the States are also trying to limit building single family homes. Um, so any new, new residential construction must be more than one unit to try to get the missing, what they call, what used to be called the missing middle, you know, duplexes, triplexes, um, things that appear like a single family home, but actually are quite denser. Um, and so, uh, so I think it's yeah I think it's both of those those situations. So Tristan and I were discussing over dinner the other day. We're trying to figure out like whether there is a good applicable term that can be blanketed over the, the stylistic components of the work, you know. And we never really came up with anything that was great, right? But we were trying to you know it's like it feels like it's super refined in a lot of ways, like it's an architecture of perfect tangencies and things like that, or you know, but there's like something kind of post digital that, and then. We start we kept coming back to like it feels like a lot of the stuff was generated out of Rhino, you know, where it's like you can be super precise about you know, aligning and making you know these perfect geometries that you know get screwed out perfectly, and then arrive at some kind of perfect condition. Um, and I was really curious to know like how much do you feel like the tools um, that you're using for representation um, affect that process? Kind of coming back to the step of process question maybe from a different angle. Uh, hmm. I, how much does the tools, I feel like it's less about the tools and it's more about the set of techniques or the set of, or the ways of working with form and geometry that, that are, you know, that's so, well, it's my interest, number one, but, um, but also a little bit of just my, like my formal education too. So I think, um, and also, I mean, we we were in the kind of like end of the digital, so I think there's a kind of resistance to like um, how can you how can you push one thing to produce enough complexity without being exuberant or without being you know it's a lot. I mean, you know, we were scripty scripty back in the day, and, <laughs> and it was it was a lot. So a lot of it's a lot of the restraint is is. Um, is kind of a re- resistant to that, but also appreciating that there's something else happening there too that's like maybe undescribable in, in, in your terms. Do you think that your process, therefore, is like pretty intuitive as you're going through it, or is it really rational? Like, here's 17 techniques that we've identified that we can use to move our way from you know, this set of programmatic requirements and uh, contextual baggage, right, that might mm-hmm. like, come with the side of the room. And, you know, by moving through these steps really rigorously, we arrive at some rational conclusion. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, I'm always trying to figure out, you know, how can I take, how can the rigor of this, you know, working with this cylinder, or working with this cone, or working with this geometry, how can the rigor of that produce something that feels intuitive or or maybe I mean, I mean that's I'm always pushing myself to or maybe slightly messy or sloppy but actually is quite controlled and actually quite composed um, so yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, 
kind of riffing on Stephanie Williams' questions, like what what kind of research goes into using these vernacular shapes and typologies as like um, form generating devices? One is just the kind of appreci appreciation appreciation for them. I think that the um, like the vernacular or the ordinary or the normal are like things that kind of are at the fringes of the canon of, of architecture. We don't really learn that in school, you know? So it's a kind of like trying to bridge the high and the low on the one hand. So I guess maybe the geometry might be the high, but then the kind of like symbolism or the accessibility of like everyone understands what a gable is, is maybe a, the low or, or a shingle, or no, you know? But in doing something different with that and, and trying to bring those two worlds together. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's you know like this is weird, right? Like you know why did he do that? You know like <laughs> and part of it's necessity. Um, but I mean I, I I I look at this facade on the left and I am always perplexed, and then I look at the columns over here and I'm always perplexed too. And it's something that probably didn't happen all at once, but but came like happened over time. And there's something beautiful about that. Um, and I just after my education, I can I can appreciate that as something beautiful and, and something to hold on to and aspire towards. Yeah. Did you have any family history on the building? Did you have family history on the I didn't. I did not. I. I did not actually. Um, he actually, you know, would spend his time in DC. So he, he would leave for the week and go work in DC in and around the Capitol. Um, and I think this was just kind of this baby that he would come back to during the weekend and, and kind of like change something or do something new. Um, and even when I was a kid, you know, he was always fixing it and working on it. So. So this intentional ambiguity that I think you're right, like does somehow exist in the, the weirdness of the, the two forms that come together, but also be a really consistent and intentional element of work. Uh, is there like a specific emotional state that you're after with that? Like, is it an intrigue, something that pulls people in? Is it like that the un inability to resolve one geometry fully that? You know, like it's trying to produce some emotional, you know, logical state. It's just no. something cool to work with. No. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the geometry and stuff, it's just a kind. Of, it's kind of a. It's kind of a, a way of working, and it's a kind of constraint that I, I, arbitrarily place onto the work to help me make decisions that you know satisfy site program. And everyone has their own way into that, you know, material, um, perception. Uh, so, so for me, this is this is this is the thing. But that's great. I appreciate the honesty of that answer. That's wonderful. I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, so, on the project where you're showing uh, like multi housing for teenagers trying to get back into the world. Mm -hmm. you know, um, what are some of the elements that you're sort of thinking that um, this place is really going to help them to move into the world compared to like regular units? Are you thinking about like oh maybe more natural light or the other? Uh, I mean, I think in that case, I mean the 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 organization that we had in mind when we were designing that project. Um, they have many different kinds of outreach initiatives, and so the idea was just simply that that they can they can be embedded in the neighborhood that they're closely working in, and have their staff live there short term and be in close proximity to their work, and um, so they can be as engaged as, as they need to be. Um, so that was really simply the the thing there and, and of course other themes of of interior exterior you know the light well there's a light well in there there's, there's the terraces there's the kind of like um defamiliarizing certain kinds of contextual materials and and forms and figures um but yeah that, that was really that was really the thinking thinking there 
Um, Would you consider, for example, adding programs to you know, let's say agriculture or farming or some sort of other otherness that is not this professional, but it's more like you know doing things with your hands and giving them skills and sort of being able to jump into the world or something? Uh, well, I, I mean, we, we did consider some other programs. We thought we wanted a kind of collective space that the community can kind of gather and then a space that, that the staff can kind of run in the back and kind of can't be engaged in this exterior space. Um, I don't know if agricultural farming would be the best yeah, maybe thing to propose in, for that neighborhood and, and that constituent, but, um, but yeah, we did shop. We did we did shift through a few things when we were you know when we were thinking about that program. Is this still standing? This is still standing. Yes. Where? In Bishopville, South Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah. Bishopville. Mm -hmm. Population. Five thousand. What's the zip code? Yeah. Seems like a lot of your ideation. This practice of using shapes and folding them and being really tactile and exploring leads to this more real-world example of how that's actually embodied and function. And I think that's a really beautiful process and there's a part of me that's curious if you sometimes indulge in that or you dive into it and you come out with a lot of these different cool variations of it that just kind of come to a cross or a block where you don't know how that actually applies in the real-world space. I'm curious if that happens and how do you how do you navigate those kinds of those situations? Uh, I mean, I always feel like that in my process that I always post something that feels appropriate, you know, and that I did my due diligence in in terms of testing things out. So, yeah, I, I mean, every every product comes up against certain kinds of constraints and realities that you have to kind of work through, but. I think when I put a set of designs forward that I'm you know, being very thoughtful about each study and each scenario and what it means. Um, and when I teach, I, I want my students to do the same thing. You know, I want them to be able to see what they're doing. What, is, what does it mean for the site? What does it mean for the program? Uh, and how does form motivate or not motivate those, those different things? How does your design process change with software packages? Would you do the same? If you had an idea for something, would you decide if you wanted to implement it on Sketch or would you say, well, implement this on digital design or launch or whatever? Do you, do you go to the software package first and then look at your design or do you think of the design first and then go to software? Uh, I think at this point it's like a way of thinking than, than the software. Yeah, the software. software. It's just a tool to enable. To, do you find that you can access the software to implement your ideas? I think students Quickly. should be well versed. I think designers should be well versed in yeah. software and to have a knowledge of it. And they're all, once you know one, you can kind of get into the other. Yeah, but it's, it's, it shouldn't be the thing that's that's determining that the output actually should be your... I have no idea you say that it shouldn't be. No, no, not at all. On the uh, reparations project, I kind of think I just remember the question that you used about that. Yeah. What was the, I'm kind of curious, uh, what was the kind of process of lot selection like? And what, and what you guys all said was narrow lot into the lot. And what other kind of selections of lots were there? a choice um, and uh, I, I mean, uh, most of the houses before that I mean the two projects this summer were both urban projects so um, I was just very excited that you know on one one hand I'm, I'm working at an entire block scale on the other hand I just wanted to work on something that was like completely constrained and, and infill and like what what can we do with this so there were some other sites that were there was a corner one that would probably be very desirable because it was like th like three parcels aggregated together so you can like the formal moves were like or what you could do with that could have been a lot right so like yeah and then there was another one that was you know kind kind of on island and that one just seemed like not to have enough contextual like constraint for me 
So I was like, I'm super excited to do something that's just like in, like just in the slot, and it's just on the front and the back and everything in between. Uh, ten or twelve, but the proposals didn't have to be a design. Like you, could, you could write something. You could kind of critique the RFP. Um, you, you know, because it was a part of a, a, a an exhibition in the end, really, just to kind of um, to provoke and foster conversation around this issue. Any final questions? Um, <laughs> what do you think of the different scales at which defamiliarization works as a strategy? Right, so it's like, you know, having something on scale of that structure, I think, is a uh, you know, it's an intriguing object in all the landscape in some way. But it's like, is the experience of defamiliarization on the scale of like a city just culture shock? Like, you know, what does that scale into? Well, I think this uh, thinking about this question, I'm really interested in this. Strategy of defamiliarization, but that the defamiliarization um, is not like replacing something with something else. It's 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 kind of like uh, it's, it's defamiliarizing something known so that you can kind of appreciate it anew, and so that there's a kind of so there's something new, uh, but within a kind of continuum, and that's what's really interesting about it. Um, and and uh, I, I think the projects are really beautiful on this um, as a kind of generative strategy of um, uh, using geometry to radicalize type um, to to produce this kind of defamiliarization that's really interesting and, and convincing um, and like the, as a kind of uh, pedagogical lesson lesson on kind of uh, uh, process, or like, you know, we talk where we're, we're involved with thesis now, mm -hmm. and defining our own approaches to how we want to practice and, and make change in the world. I think this is a kind of object lesson in that. Um, I mean, my question would be: uh, I, what I was thinking is, um, so you know, that as uh, that, that 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 kind of mixture of type and geometry um, as a generative. Process is super convincing. I mean, you also talk about you know all of these have a kind of materialization, and um, and, and there's some um, you know experimenting with, with new materials. Where does like where does like the, the, the messiness of material um, kind of figure into that generative process? I know. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> The work has been moving that way, and I think I I think you know I mentioned earlier in, in my collaborations with the engineers and, and speaking with some fabricators that that's actually been quite fruitful. Uh, it's uncomfortable sometimes, uh, but I think that means it's good, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, even this product, it's like the kind of like the, the most the furriest furriest thing that I've done, you know, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's something that I've learned, I've grown to embrace, um, because the, the material dimension, you know, comes with another set of, uh, baggage that I appreciate, um, on one hand, but also it, it, Forces the geometry. It forces the. It forces certain things that you know I'm, I'm, I'm unwilling to kind of let go in the process. So I'm more concerned about the ways in which the geometries kind of motivate and 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 push typology and spatialized typology. I'm more in terms of interested in the spatial aspect of, of the work, um, and it has you know so obviously I've grown to appreciate how that how the material also can equally inform that. Thanks. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.